I did. Mom! Harrison? Hey! Are you okay? How'd you get here? With Dad. Chad Ashcroft, 39, skateboarding accident. Deformity of the right ankle, no LOC, good vitals, got four of morphine en route. Skateboarding, really? I'm fine, by the way. You two family? X. X. This is Chad, Harrison's dad. Nice to finally put a face to a name. McKay, stay with your kid. Let's take this half pipe prince to South 19. Hey, what's the golden rule? No hospitals. Okay, let's add no skating without a helmet ever again. You hear me? Yes, Mom. Uh, distal tibia and fibula with an unsafe. So before we get into the, they then take him to a room and they x-ray him and there's an interesting kind of scene that transpires here. But before we get into that, yeah. uh, the doctor who's that kid's mom, yeah. when she leans down, she says, what's the golden rule? And he oh. says, no hospitals. Cause it's <laughs> like, no matter what you do, don't come to the emergency department. Yeah, right, right, right. The last place you you want to be. Exactly. Yeah. The, the common mantra of a healthcare worker. Right, <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, aside from the, I mean, the interpersonal aspects there are obviously interesting and what happens when a patient shows up that you know, but I also like the ankle fracture just because it's so common. Yeah. No, I was just going to say that, yeah, there's a whole kind of discussion there around, you know, somebody walking in who you know or recognize. And, you know, many of us work in our communities. It's a distinct possibility. And, you know, a long time ago, it was the only possibility when we think about when when medicine was more hyper local in this way. Um, right. You know, you, you did take care of family and friends all the time. I think in in our current world, depending on, you know, what city you live in and how many hospitals there are, it might be less likely. But it's a reality we all have to get comfortable with and and kind of understand. I appreciate that this highlights, I think, one of the more common things you see in the emergency department more than any of us do which is accidents, not wearing helmets. So she mentions this to the kid where she said, you know, this is, this is the last time you'll ever skateboard without a helmet. And it's one of these kind of public health measures, right, that we talk about, helmets, seat belts, things like that. But I think you in the emergency department, you see the most of this. You really see the other side of that coin with the amount of damage that can happen uh, when, when folks aren't careful there. So it's, I, I appreciate highlighting that. Yes. Hold on, show us the lateral, please. Here you go. Mm. Not two, three brinks. Jesus. Wait, so now I get a cast? Uh, no, a splint and then surgery to stabilize the bones with plates and screws so they can heal properly. Oh, how long am I gonna be stuck here? Mm -hmm. That is above my pay grade, Gabriel. <laughs> but you may want to cancel any dinner reservations you may have. <laughs> Set up for a double splint, posterior leg, and sugar tongue. Well, is that going to be painful? So yeah, the, so the x-ray confirms uh, what they thought at the beginning, that the ankle's broken in three places. So they're going to put, they say, a double splint. I wouldn't usually call it that, but that's, that is essentially what's happening. Like, we're putting a splint with two pieces of uh, orthoglass or um, plaster. So one is a sugar tongue that goes around like this, goes around the bottom of the ankle, and the other is a posterior that goes around the back. And then the whole thing gets wrapped up. So it keeps the ankle from doing this or from doing this. If I'm understanding this right, and this is an example of stuff that I see a little bit less as a primary care doctor, you're essentially trying to stabilize these broken bones and kind of make sure that they don't misalign further. Is that the idea here? Yeah, exactly. So it's a a multi-stage process when you have a broken bone that's as severe as this, or in this case, multiple broken bones. So the first thing is going to be to make sure the position of the break, that it's compromising the arteries or the nerves mm -hmm. so that it's not okay. affecting the blood flow to the leg or the yep. foot or affecting the, the nerves there. And so if there's concern that it might be, we will pull on the foot or the, on the ankle and kind of slide things back in place. So we want everything to be more or less aligned the way that it's supposed to be. It's not going to be perfect, but if it's way out of place, it'll be put back into place. That's called a reduction. So usually we will either give a lot of local anesthesia, inject medicine to numb up that part of the body, or just put somebody to sleep. So that's the first step. And then the second step is stabilizing and protecting it. So we put a splint on. A splint basically looks like a cast. It's a it's hard material. It gets wrapped up. It holds the, the uh, joint in place but it's meant to be temporary. That's basically the difference between the splint and the cast. And then this patient's gonna need surgery. So that splint will stay on for comfort and protection until they take the patient to the operating room. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. 
There may be some discomfort. I assure you, we will prescribe proper pain medication to provide you with adequate relief. Drop 100 of propofol, 50 of fat. Whatever, just knock me out. With pleasure. How are you doing? <laughs> Maybe it might be worth uh, double clicking yep. on the anesthesia here. Yeah, yeah, I, I thought that so too. Yeah, well, folks might have heard of these medications before, uh, right? We heard uh, propofol. Yeah, I, I think, and I think we heard fent. Yes, which is fentanyl. Yes, both medications. I think most people have probably heard of in a variety of circumstances. So maybe you can just kind of talk us through real quick each of those and and why we might be leaning towards those medications in this environment versus kind of other ones. Yeah, great question. So propofol is an anesthetic. It essentially puts people to sleep. It's a white liquid and it also has an amnestic capability. It makes you forget what happened while you were asleep. So some people uh, nickname it milk of amnesia because it looks like milk and it makes you forget things. You might have heard it in the, in the news because unfortunately it was the medication that killed Michael Jackson. So it's actually a very safe medication when it's used in the proper setting. The problem is that it can slow down your breathing or even make you stop breathing. Now, when we give it in the emergency department, we're prepared for that to happen. We bring airway equipment to the bedside. We have a ventilator if we need access to it. We are able to protect that person's airway. But unfortunately, if it's given like at somebody's house or outside of a hospital, which is what happened sadly with Michael Jackson, then it can be really dangerous because he wasn't being monitored. So people sometimes do a double take when they hear that we're about to give it to him in the hospital. But in the hospital, it's considered a very safe medication because we have the tools to address any problems that might come up. And the other is fentanyl. So similarly, like maligned and justifiably maligned outside the hospital, obviously has been part of the opioid epidemic. But in the hospital, again, with the right monitoring, it's a very safe and useful medication. It's an opioid analgesic medication, so it's great for pain control. And so we use it in situations like this for extreme trauma to control patient's pain. Uh, and again, when it's monitored, it's actually tolerated very well. Yeah, yeah, that, that all makes sense. And I think, you know, especially with, with both of these medications, they are relatively short acting, yeah, which is right. really yeah. useful in this setting, right? Where you can kind of titrate on and off, and you can give people a kind of a bolus of pain control or anesthesia uh, in order to do a quick procedure or, you know, put the cast on. Other times folks might have come across these medications, uh, you know, things like propofol commonly used for outpatient colonoscopies. Most folks do not remember most of the colonoscopy that they've had done because of that um, amnesia effect of propofol. Pretty quickly puts people to sleep. And then when you turn it off, people pretty quickly kind of come back and, you know, might take them a few minutes to get settled again, you know, wears off pretty quickly, which is great. Yeah. Continue here. What are you doing? <laughs> Not as good as you, apparently. Push another 25. What the splints now, please. You can help lift his leg for the splint. And we're at 75. Mm -hmm. When we lift his leg, it's really gonna hurt him, but he won't remember benefits of propofol. Hall socks, 99, good end, title, seal two. Hey, Chad. Chad. Um, Perfect. Let's do this. I feel sad. Uh, don't worry, we'll have you fixed up good as new. Not the most common side effect of propofol. No, but it's but not. Like, yeah. no, he's <laughs> awfully awake for propofol. Right. Um, but I think what we are seeing, which is when they look at a patient who's, who's acting like that, you might think he looks a little drunk, right? Right. Like disinhibited, kind of sleepy. And it is because it's the same mechanism that's working on the brain, right? We're talking yeah, right. about GABA receptors, that's right. yeah. which are these receptors that make you sleepy also make you a little bit disinhibited. So it's kind of like he just, you know, all of a sudden got extremely drunk, extremely fast. Right. Um, but you're right. And that in this situation, we would imagine folks to probably be a little bit less conscious. I think they just quickly mentioned end tidal CO2. So maybe you can make comments real quick on like, what are they trying to measure there? It looks like he had it in his nose where they might be measuring CO2 coming out of his, his lungs. Yeah, exactly. So there's two big ways to measure somebody's breathing, monitor somebody's breathing uh, on that monitor screen that you see next to the patient. 
that we're all familiar with from, you know, a hospital scene. One is just the oxygen level. And mm -hmm. that can be measured with a pulse ox that's on your finger. And that's that blue number. It's the blue line that shows you uh, how that measurement is changing. And then there's end tidal CO2, which measures the expired carbon dioxide out of your lungs. So we breathe in oxygen, we uh, breathe out carbon dioxide. And so by measuring that carbon dioxide that somebody is breathing out, that also gives a measure of how they're breathing and make sure that, you know, he's continuing to breathe in and out and he's he's still, you know, breathing on his own uh, even as he's getting the propofol. Yeah. So that's a great example of the type of monitoring you can do in the emergency exactly. department easily. Right. That That is otherwise kind of difficult to do in other settings. So really gives us pretty good guardrails around the ability to use these types of medications when when we need to. Exactly right.